Good evening to everyone. Thank you so much for being here. This is a fantastic turnout. Um, so much for what Facebook tells you the turnout will be. Um, we're really honored tonight to have Eusebius McKaiser speaking to us about certain topics related to his new book, Run Racist Run. Before we introduce him, um, just a little bit about Roads Must Fall. Roads Must Fall is a movement in Oxford uh, that's committed to decolonizing the space, challenging institutional racism, and our current campaign is to get Oriel College to remove a statue of Cecil John Rhodes which overlooks the high street. Just a generally cool, reflexive, fun group of people, unlike you usually meet at Oxford. So if, you, if you're interested in joining Roads Must Fall, uh, please speak to some of the many organizers who are in the room tonight, if they could put their hands up. Um, and if anyone's near you, um, there, there's going to be drinks afterwards, so I'm sure you'll be able to speak to people if you're interested in getting involved. Tonight is about shifting the debate in Oxford. Some people seem surprised that race exists in Oxford, and there seem to be very few opportunities to engage critically with that topic. And no one better, possibly in the world, at this moment in time, to engage with us about how the complexities of race have affected places like South Africa. Also, uh, spent some time in Oxford is Eusebius McKaiser. He's written three books, a Bantu in my bathroom, could I vote DA? And we know he couldn't. And the third one, <laughs> the third one is a, a Run Racist Run, which has recently just been published. It's an odyssey into the heart of racism in South Africa and really exploding a number of myths that still surround this, this crucial topic and the way it manifests both in South Africa and in places like Europe, England and Oxford. Without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to welcome Eusebius Makaza. Uh, thank you, Cizwe, and thank you to everyone who's come to this talk. Um, it's bigger than I'd expected. It. Um, it's Jacob here, the absolutist that I've heard so much about. <laughs> it's a room of people with excessive overlapping consensus. I'm hoping we will have a frank conversation, and I'd like to thank uh, Nathaniel. I think he's going to be late for helping us to have this venue and drinks afterwards, and also to the radicals who are hosting me. Roads Must Fall in Oxford, the Oxford University Africa Society, and the Oxford uh, Pan-African Forum. Um, we have very many different groups here with very different interests. Um, some friends from the Rhodes Scholar community are here. Uh, some of my close debater and Oxford friends from many years ago are in the room. Um, the radicals are here as well. Uh, some philosophy students are here from Warren College. And you each have different interests in the themes. So I wasn't quite sure who I will be addressing specifically amongst the disparate groups. So what I'm going to do is I um, hope that we can have a conversation rather than be behaving like a race guru. After all, especially white people are the ones who perpetrate racism, so you don't need a black body to be an expert on racism. <laughs> um, I'm going to speak for not more than about 15, 20 minutes and hopefully make a couple of remarks and then after that we can have a conversation and then wrap it up in an hour so we can get on with drinking and perhaps have the real conversation then. Um, so my latest book that's out, which is what the talk is centered around, is this one called Run Racist Run, Journeys into the Heart of Racism. I couldn't really bring many copies. I've got about five of them. I was going to give them away for free. So if you really want one, you make a good case, I'll give you one for free. And then there's a couple of people that I've already promised some. So I do have a few copies. Otherwise, you can buy it uh, by going to Amazon.com. And um, the title of the talk today is Black Rage, White Tears. But I'd like the conversation to be as wide ranging as possible so that we can actually be in conversation about whatever it is that is the reason why you decided to come to this event and not some other talk around the university. But in relation to what I've said, there are basically two sets of issues that I want to address in my opening remarks, and then after that we can be in conversation. The first is around black anger, and what I regard as an important public defense that is necessary at this time of getting angry and also exhibiting anger, which is a very important part of how you deal if you are a victim of racism with experiences of racism. After that, I want to say a little bit about identity politics at the moment. It's become quite fashionable to attack people for using identity politics, asserting identities in pushing back against colonialism. And then I will say a little bit about a slightly unrelated, seemingly, topic around the myth of white um, you know, privilege, not white privilege, the myth of white excellence, which was uh, specifically the text that Nathaniel had set for some of, some of the students here at Warren. And then we can have an, an open conversation around that. 
One of the, the reasons why I wrote this book, although I actually was busy with a very different book when I put it down, is that the events that have happened in South Africa this year, I think, demand the attention of writers. And to write a book about the non-existing daffodils outside my window, about being deeply in love, or the actual book I wanted to write, which is a book about illness, death, and meaning, in relation to one of my favorite South African authors, Cello Dacre, seemed a luxury in a year in which, in South Africa, student protests have just ignited the imagination of the country. Students have shattered the myth that young people born after 1994 in South Africa are ahistorical, don't have political identities, and that they don't really care deeply for intersectional fights, such as the plight of older workers who work on, in many of our universities, um, people who are poorer than you, and of course some white allies amongst the black student-led groups uh, who also have been prepared to make themselves uncomfortable in a space where they need to observe uh, black students leading those protests. And so in that context, I thought to myself, I can't possibly continue with the actual manuscript I was working on, which was called Searching for Cello Dacre. Cello Dacre is one of the great South African writers we had, who unfortunately committed suicide at a, at a relatively young age, in his early 30s. And he fascinated me in terms of the connections between psychosis, which all of you are familiar with being at Oxford, and creativity. <laughs> um, but I put that on hold because I felt that I couldn't possibly pretend that the stench of racism is actually not part of my everyday um, experience in South Africa as a black South African and as a writer. And in some ways, it would be a luxury to simply write about escapist topics like the meaning of life in a context when students are demanding the decolonization of the university space. It was also very clear to me that actually the student protests are not narrowly about, as some people suggest, curricular change, changing the demographic of the staff that are teaching. It is fundamentally tied up with exclusion in South Africa in general, and also internationally, which is why you've seen similar kinds of protests and conversations happening, variations on the theme in other parts of the world, like in North America. It's not fundamentally about the university space. I think universities in South Africa are a microcosm of the structural injustices that people are experiencing in our society in general, and although the particular fights in our universities may focus on a particular issue, such as where are the black female professors at UCT? Why are we teaching dead white philosophers at Vitz University in the philosophy department, but you won't see black people on the curriculum? Those may be the particular point on the agenda, but actually the larger context of those fights is that they are intimately connected to the structural injustices in our society in general. And I think in that context, to see the protest as just a bunch of naughty students who are doing something on the side and will grow up when they graduate, is to really miss a very important moment in South African history. I think it's the most exciting politically and the most important here politically we've had since 1994. And I think it's going to be a game changer. And um, I think 10, 15 years time, we will still feel the same about what's happened this year. But in the context of these incredibly awesome protests that have made many of us felt what the hell were we doing at university as undergraduates and postgraduates? We applied for fancy things like the Rhodes Scholarship, which if you call there this way, we'll have a name change. <laughs> and we applied on those things on the basis of being the coolest kids on our university campuses who care deeply about social justice. And it's very clear to me that actually we were not half as conscious as a lot of the students are who are currently involved in the protests across the globe and in South Africa. Even those of us who thought we were exceptions to the disinterest in real politic in our societies. We actually weren't. We were co-conspirators in perpetuating some of the structural violence that happens in places, including at Oxford, where year in and year out, some of us who thought we are very different creatures were happy to toast to the founder for his great adventures into Africa, which of course was far from a great adventure. And so for me, the question then becomes, how do you engage, how do you engage as a protester, as an activist, as a writer, and very interestingly, what I would have thought would be a year in which we have a lot to be proud of in how we articulate the incredible political consciousness of so many students in a place like South Africa has turned into the most bizarre mudslinging matches in public debate in South Africa about what these decolonization movements are about. And it would take us the whole night to deconstruct, agree and disagree with a minutiae of different pushbacks against some of the protests that have happened, so we can't do that. But there are two strands of pushback that I wanted to highlight and that I wanted to debunk, uh, which I will do again when I get to South Africa next week because it's currently the news cycle. The first is an incredible fear 
about students, especially black students, being pissed off. If you are angry, let alone exhibiting anger, it is seen as a mark of irrationality, not being in control of a conversation, or at the very least, a tactical mistake if you are hoping to persuade someone else to change their behavior or their attitude to, towards some important aspect of the agenda of decolonization. And so the question arises, does anger have any moral value? Does it have any instrumental value in the decolonization movement? And what do you say to the person who'd like to be in conversation with you, but on the ground, procedurally, that you should be dispassionate, very calm, and that those are key parts of the rules of engagement in order to make progress? So that's one question. In parallel to that, we've seen a lot of critics thinking that identity politics is absolutely noxious. That because of identity politics, some people can't be heard because of their positionality. And I'll give some examples of that in a second. And some people, some of the critics feel as if their views are a priori, stupid, offensive, just because of social facts about themselves. And these are two very serious and very popular criticisms of some of the protests <coughs> happening in South Africa at the moment. And I also think that they're deeply flawed and they're very interesting. And there's a chapter in my book, Anger Misunderstood, that is a full essay in this book that actually gives an exposition of why <coughs> anger is actually very important. And I want to say a little bit about that. One reason why I think anger is very important is quite simply because certain moral emotions, when you feel them, are a social indicator that something is sick in your society. Something is broken. If you don't ever experience affective states, emotions, then I think, as with someone who doesn't feel pain, you will never become aware when your body is ill, or by analogy, when your society is actually ill. I think intellectually, without feeling, it is possible to know that there's something unjust in a society like South Africa, because the facts can tell you that. So, Feeling emotion and exhibiting emotion are not necessary criteria for knowing that there's injustice in South Africa, but they are darn useful ways of knowing that something is wrong with your society. I think it is, from a phenomenological point of view, bizarre for someone to know and experience racism on a daily basis and never experience emotions like being angry. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Because the experience of anger is a necessary part of knowing that you are experiencing something that is morally and socially warped about the country in which you live. And so the expectation that there will never be emotions running high when you talk about racism, when you articulate what racism does to you, that is someone who is in deep denial about how morally sick a society is and how it affects people who actually have to be the ones experiencing the brunt of that racism in their society. It really doesn't make sense to me at all that someone wants to talk about racism or any kind of violence all the time in wholly unemotional ways. It just doesn't make sense to me. Because the experience of violence inculcates in you legitimate and defensible anger about the world in which you are, are living. But if you legitimately experience anger as a result of the injustices that you witness and that you experience, then of course an emotion like anger will naturally flow from your belly, from your heart, from your entire being. If it didn't, I would venture to add, that I think there's something not fully human about you because an important part of our interaction as social creatures is that we're not just beings who live intellectually, we also live socially and emotionally. So there's a bizarre di dichotomy that some critics want to push on us between unemotive intellectual discourse and people who get angry and can't possibly be in control of the intellectual moves that they make. And I think that that is, that is absolutely silly and I also think that it's not true that uh, you can only make progress in a discussion about the nature of racism, how to push back against racism if you are calm. I think getting angry is very important in order for you to know and express disapproval of what is going on in your society. There's also the instrumental value, besides the fact that I think the expression of disapproval about deep injustices is self-justifying. And the instrumental value is that, in theory, and these are the things you will say in the academy until you try and become an activist in the real world. In theory, of course, you can fight to try and dismantle injustice in your society without feeling or exhibiting anger, right? I mean, there's no logical reason why you need to get angry before you can actually chip away at injustices in your society. But in practice, I think it is the case that you are more likely to intervene in a situation that is deeply unjust to try and bring about a more just society 
if you actually do get angry and you exhibit your anger. Otherwise, if you don't feel and you're not motivated to bring about change, you will be a bystander to injustice or intellectualize about injustice in papers at obscure conferences where the victims of the injustice never actually arrive and their social reality will never change. So there's a motivating power that getting angry has that helps you to bring about change. I mean, if we take, to take a very pers the personal example within our scholar community, some scholars are engaged in the decolonization movement, others are not. I think the ones who are not don't feel the injustices that happen in South Africa, including some white South African road scholars. And so if you don't feel those injustices, then you can assert that you care about them. You can even write a cute little paper about it in Oxford while you're here. But what are you actually doing to try and bring about changes in the curriculum in South Africa to help mobilize your university, against your universities back home, your alma mater, to make sure that they hire more black staff, that they actually try and reduce the costs of getting into university in South Africa. What are you doing about those things practically? And I think an important reason why there's a gap between the assertion, the putative assertion of progressive politics among some white South Africans and the lack of demonstrable evidence that they actually are trying to bring about social change in our country is precisely because they fetishize not feeling. Yes. And when you do that, I think you're less likely to actually agitate for change and be involved in change. And the same applies to me. I think what this book represents is a very uncomfortable shift in my own understanding of the role of the writer in South Africa. My first book, Ubuntu, in my bathroom, although it had views that I think many conservatives of Africa, especially the bits about gay sex, uh, would really be grappling with, in a sense, it was a very calm book and it was really philosophy 101 for the public in South Africa. In this book, there's a lot of swearing, quite liberating to say fuck off, especially when you return to Oxford seven years later. <laughs> and, and the reason for that is that I think writing a dispassionate column week in and week out when there are real structural changes in your society that are needed doesn't make South Africa a more just space. You've got to get your hands dirty. And in a sense, what I'm suggesting about emotion and moral emotions is that when you feel them, you're more likely to be that person who gets your hands dirty. And so for me, it's very important that we don't actually caricature the value, um, tactically and otherwise, of getting angry. I want to say a little bit, because um, my time control is not, not, a, not very good. I want to say a little bit about the, other, about the other pushback in South Africa. So I don't want to make the examples parochial, because there are examples um, internationally, especially in the States, lots of debates happening in some of the key publications, online especially. But for those of you who know about South African politics, we've seen in the last couple of weeks, the last few weeks in particular, um, as recently as Monday, we've seen some, especially, and I mention this because it's salient, and I'll explain why in a second, white men in particular pushing back against identity politics. So the first strand of the pushback is this assumption that people who get angry can't possibly be interlocutors in a debate about decolonization. Of course, that's rubbish. You can get angry and still out-debate the person who is calm. But the other pushback that we've seen are people such as the former leader of the Democratic Alliance, our new <coughs> opposition party, Tony Leon, who has a column in the Business Day, a current senior um, MP in the Democratic Alliance, Michael Cardo, studied at the UK, obviously at Cambridge, not at Oxford, um, <laughs> writing vitriolic stuff about identity politics, and a columnist who's a former, former staff member, and a couple of other MPs who've been writing a couple of articles that have very similar themes that run throughout them based on caricatures of what identity politics are actually about. And I want to mention one or two of them uh, before set, setting this up for, for discussion. The first claim that they make is that an inherent danger of identity politics is that you essentialize the race categories. So being black becomes some incredibly mythical, metaphysical property and you make it seem as people as if people have essences. There's some essential notion of what it means to be black, what it means to be white. So that's one gripe. A second gripe they have is that the right to speech is unfairly being limited just in virtue of someone's positionality. So literally a couple of these guys have said they feel as white South African men, they're not allowed to disagree with someone who reports on their black pain because, allegedly, as a result of identity politics, anyone who reports on their subjective experiences cannot be challenged. 
And before you know it, you're going to have an illiberal society, and all the constitutional values that we agreed to in 1994 may as well be flushed down the toilet. And the question is, are those fair criticisms of the way in which identities are being asserted by young people, by black people, by women, and all the intersectional politics that we see? And I don't think it is, and it actually angers me the extent to which incredible intellectual activism that we've seen from South African students in particular have been mischaracterized and misdescribe, not even set up accurately and generously before you offer some disagreement. So it's not that disagreement isn't allowed, but it really is a profound form of epistemic violence, the extent to which what actually is being articulated and argued by so many of our students in South Africa, the black ones in particular, have simply been summarized in really flimsy caricatures of what those messages actually are. I, don't, I haven't come across one single person who have written about the decolonization movement in South Africa who imagine that there is a black essence, or that there's a white essence, or that someone is a priori incapable of making a good argument just on account of them being a white male. So who they attribute that position to, I'm not quite sure. But obviously, the purpose of some of this pushback is not truth, it's not sound argument. The purpose is to try and defend your own hegemony as a white person. Because if you can psychologize your interlocutor and offer reasons why your right to speech is somehow being undermined, then you, you don't have to deal with the substance of the politics that have actually been, been um, offered against you. So I think there's a functional reason why you see these straw man responses to identity politics. And the function is to undermine some really good arguments that you're unable to actually deal with. Because the reality is, if we didn't have a history of colonialism and a history of apartheid in South Africa, then white privilege would not, would not be a thing. Okay, so let me just pause on that, because it's a very important point. I mean, Michael Cardo, the senior DAMP that I'm referring to, actually accused me a couple of days ago of, of ascribing to white people an essential notion of what it means to be white. Okay? And a fetishizing of whiteness studies in an ahistorical manner, which was the biggest insult, okay? <laughs> that there's something ahistorical about the identity politics. Now, just, uh, just, just think through how that logic works. What he is suggesting the actual argument is about how privilege operates is that people have privilege <clears throat> purely in virtue of being white. But that's never been the argument from the decolonization movement. People have privilege as a result of a history, a contingent history of anti-black racism that predates apartheid and goes back to its colonial roots. It's contingent. It's not essential. It's not necessary. The world could have played out in a different way, but it didn't. <coughs> and so to pretend that you're being attacked just because you are white is to misconstrue a his historic mm. bit of analysis that is specific to how the history of the world has played out. We could have lived in a world in which anti-white racism really is a thing, but it's not. Right? So there's no essential notion of blackness that drives identity politics. It's all about the contingent history as we all actually know it. But the reason why it's convenient to say, ah, oh, these identity politics people are being ahistorical, is because you can then not deal with the rest of the arguments about the importance of checking your privilege and helping to dismantle privilege in institutions across the country. And I think it's very important that we don't fall uh, for that kind of argument. I want to say just the last uh, thing around this. There is also this spurious claim, which we talked about just before we came here, that the consequences of identity politics is that my speech rights as a heteronormative man, white, in South Africa, are being compromised. And I think here it's very important to expose a very simple conflation that happens by some, in some of these critics' uh, retorts. There's a conflation of the right to speech with moral engagement on the content of your speech act. If you are callous about black pain, as some of the colonists are in South Africa, some of the senior white opposition MPs are, if you're callous about black pain, if you caricature the nature of identity politics and how it plays out, if you don't want to have an honest conversation about the nature of unearned privilege and how it operates in society, it is very, very important that we understand when people are trying to sidestep that debate by pretending that you're asking them to shut up. No one is asking you, if you are a heterosexual white man, to shut up. That would be to deny your right to speech. But when the content of the speech act that you've been performed 
are being engaged very closely for being morally odious, for example, you have to push back against that. Not every criticism has to be accepted, but there is a difference between someone engaging you and suggesting that the views that you've just performed, or even the tone with which you have articulated an argument that is actually innocuous, if someone is engaging you on those terms, you need to defend yourself by saying, here's why the content of my views are true, here's why the manner in which I'm articulating my views as a white person feeling under siege should actually be respected tonally, and also in terms of how my lived experiences are not quite what you imagine them to be, and I don't experience privilege in the way in which you do. I'm not trying to suggest that those debates um, should be prejudged in terms of which views comes out, come out more strongly. But there's this false belief that when certain views are being challenged for being morally odious, that you are challenging someone's right to speak. And I think it's very important that we actually call people out who conflate those two views. It's a functional fallacy that is aimed at making you feel bad for actually challenging the content of someone's speech. Okay. Now, I wanted to say something finally about meritocracy and the myth around white excellence, especially in a country like South Africa, which is the reading that Nathaniel had said. But I think I've said enough by way of introductory remarks that I will shut up at this point and allow us an opportunity to engage. Thanks very much. Um, we're going to take a round of questions and I hope just to inspire a conversation. We don't like this notion that the, the point of an audience is to come and catch the question or the speaker out. We just want to hear your views and have a conversation. So we'll take, say, three points and then we'll ask Eusebius to respond to how the conversation plays itself out. So are there any uh, takers? I see one. Um, any other hands? So I think we'll start with you at the back. We'll go with you, and then we'll go with the gentleman in the orange shirt. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, as an angry black woman, I do want to ask your opinion specifically because you talked about uh, trying to in, engage, like being able to engage in certain things um, in order to achieve objectives. And I wanted your opinion as to the pushback that's often received that um, failure to talk in, I suppose, parallels to Naomi Wolf or lean in politics that if you don't talk in a certain way, you won't achieve those objectives. And that in fact, I, I would like, your, like, do we say that people who fail, who decide to remove themselves from anger and in an attempt to achieve those objectives, does that mean their objectives somehow are tainted or flawed or how do you see that? Okay. <coughs> Um, mine isn't like as intense as that, but I just wanted to know how you would react to the sort of attitude that, especially like talking about the student protests, um, you know, this is just a student thing, it will pass in a few years, I'll get proper jobs and move on, like, how would you react to that attitude? Thank you for your talk, it's very dense. I would like to put the, the, the question this way. I was very moved when apartheid fell down and saddened and I'm wondering if it's something in African people themselves that they have to forgive. They, in South Africa, they started the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, led by Desmond Tutu. I watched it on TV. I saw um, Steve Biko's mother sitting there while he picked both two and the other crew, told the commission how they beat him to death, okay? And then after the problem was over, he gets forward before a TV audience, clapped and cheered as if he was some sort of hero. In, in Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, Ian Smith lived there until his dying day, unmolested, even though he had perpetrated some terrible genocide against African people. Same thing in the United States. I'm putting to you, is the fact that African peoples in general seem to want to not get angry because they're fearful of upsetting their white peers? I did a, a program la um, last year where I looked at why is that 70% of people born in England of Caribbean origin, boys I'm talking about, marry European girls. I lost friends because of it. Is it because we're frightened? I'm talking about African people now of offending our white partners, our white friends, our white colleagues, that we don't get angry, we bury it, and if you do meet someone
someone who wants to raise such issues, you get they get shunned away. So lastly, I want to say that white people themselves do not want to face, do not want to address their own history. And so when, it's a, when I address it to them, they're offended and ask, how can you do this? Thank you. Okay, so, I mean, thanks, thanks for those interventions. Um, I want us to have a conversation, so if you like fewer questions would also be cool. If you just want to make a comment or engage one another, but I, I will react to, react to them. I'm certainly not, not some sort of guru, and uh, Nathaniel rightly wants to create an egalitarian space. Um, I want to start with the last one. You know, whiteness is such a powerful thing that we are shit scared of what white people will say when we talk about our anger as black people. One of my biggest, biggest fears in, write, in publishing this book was, what will my white friend say? Will Will Jones still be my friend if he discovers that you see this? <laughs> actually an angry black man, although he was more convivial when you were partying at the Bayer Beach Club in Rotterdam. And, Rotterdam. <laughs> and it's amazing, so much so that throughout the book you will find apologies that are almost like tactical attempts to, to make my white friends not feel like they've lost me. Um, and I think that's because whiteness is so powerful that it affects us even when we think the most we're the most radical amongst the lot. And we absolutely are not. When my white South African friends bought the book, I was biting my nails wondering what they would say because a lot of the middle chapters skewer self-defined liberals and progressives in South Africa who I find intellectually and morally far more interesting to think and write about than someone who is an uncontroversial example of a racist. And that means that many of those friends that you regard as white allies in the fight to dismantle the remnants of anti-black racism will be people who display some of the, I don't call it non-violent because I think it's inherently violent, but some of the non-bloody manifestations of unearned privilege and racism. And they will be surprised because after all, they share with you, for example, a revulsion at clear cases of racism. And if someone agrees with you about how horrible um, an uncontroversial example of racism is, then for you to say, by the way, buddy, can we actually talk about what you said yesterday and how that's a manifestation of unearned privilege, that self-reflexive, that invitation for them to be self-reflexive can be experienced very painfully. And if you have gone to a multicultural school, if you've gone to a racially mixed school like I have, if you've been to a liberal university like Rhodes University in South Africa, if you're on a scholarship program like the Rhodes, you tend to fetishize conviviality over honesty. And the, the consequences of that is this constant fear. So even this book that is meant to be me coming out of the closet as a radical black is one where you will see evidence <laughs> of a black person really, really scared of how his white liberal friends will react. And that's, that's just how powerful it is. Um, so I totally agree with your remarks. And one question it raises amongst many that I address here is, how, what should be your relationship then with white allies? And what is the, the role of white allies in this fight? And one of the essays where I had the most sleepless nights over how my white friends will react is an essay entitled, What Do Black People Want From Me? In quotes. And it's a parody of a question I often get in South Africa. And the black South Africans here will testify they get the same, where a white person tries to demonstrate their commitment to be a good ally in the fight to dismantle anti-black racism by, by asking, what do you want me to do? Please just give me a template to deliver me from my white guilt. And my response is, go figure it out on your own. Don't ask me. I'm the victim of anti-black racism. If you're a beneficiary of it, you have the intellectual tools to figure out how you benefit from it, how it operates, even though you haven't chosen to be white. And surely then you also have the skill to reason morally and practically about what you might do to try and rid yourself of being a beneficiary of things that you haven't chosen. So I'm fully on board with that. Um, and the first, in the, in the very first essay, part of that lament about, about even talking about racism, I wrote an entire bloody essay to start the book with that frankly should be torn out of the book called Deco Lied. And it's me <coughs> just having a really self-indulgent reflection about how I wish I didn't write a book about racism before I actually go on to talk about racism. 
and I lament there how friends of mine or columnists that I like and writers I like in South Africa, Rebecca Davis, who's, who was here at Oxford, a really funny white South African uh, writer who writes beautifully, Tom Eaton, who's a really funny columnist, and in the first essay, I, I'm even apologetic about writing about racism. And I say, I wish I didn't write about race, because part of my burden is worrying that I will be burdening my white friends to have to engage me on a topic they don't want to. So I'm fully on board with you, and it would be helpful if white people have these conversations without us mediating them. Very quickly, on the other two questions, I, I partly tried to cover it in my main remarks, the one about the year. Obviously, <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball and can't speak on behalf of the planet, but in South Africa, I think you'd be an idiot if you think that the student protest will be fleeting. I think over the course of our democracy, it's a complete game changer in ways that are really interesting. So for example, it's not actually only a black and white issue. All of our main political parties, including the African National Congress, uh, led by the worst leader it's ever had in its history, are coming under fire from the students. So the pushback flows from racism, but the pushback is not against white South Africans. It's against an entire society that is sick, including a black-led government that in many ways operates policies or implements policies that are anti-black and that simply increases inequities in our society to levels that are in some cases worse than they were 20 years ago. And in that context, I think, which is part of the reason why I hate the caricatures of, of the student movement, is that it, the horse is bolted. There's such a profound awareness amongst young South Africans that the rest of us didn't have and don't have about how deeply unequal society is, I don't think it can ever be business as usual again. I think, I, I, yeah, I mean, I stand to be corrected in a couple of years, but I'd be very shocked if this turned out to have been just another student protest about fees, which happens every year. I think there's something very different about this moment. Um, maybe I didn't make very clear my sort of caveats when it comes to anger. Getting angry is not a necessary condition for making progress. There's a lot to be said for being calm, having a glass of wine, and reflecting on what you might do to try and get rid of a bit of misogyny in the way in which people speak in class and then giving them calm feedback and then checking on how their speech goes throughout the term. So I'm certainly not going to make an <laughs> argument that anger, feeling it and exhibiting, are necessary criteria in order to dismantle injustices. I don't think that's true at all. I think it would be an interesting tactical or strategic question one can have about what you say to the person who tries to operate within the rules of engagement and within the existing social structures and try and win battles differently with different styles, different modes of expression. I think those are perfectly acceptable and mutually reinforcing ways of um, achieving the same ends. I'm not going to say to someone who decides to speak well, to learn certain forms of speech, someone who chooses not to get angry or to exhibit anger, that they start somehow selling up. And actually, it's, there's a very important point to be made here. Um, I mean, I get, you know, Cesar was asking why I've got so many trolls when he announced that I'm coming here. And my trolls are interesting in South Africa. They're not just white racists. There's also a lot of black people on the left that, that are my trolls. And part of the reason is that the, 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 students, the students are not homogenous, but there are some students who think that there are markers of what it means to be a true black and a true radical and a true interlocutor to bring about change in society. So if you dare to have friendships with white people, then somehow you don't get what the true aims are of decolonization. I think that's absolute rubbish. I don't see why interracial friendship is morally or instrumentally an obstacle to us dismantling injustices in society. So there are, there are really unhealthy practices that have crept into the way in which the student politics are playing out. There's a chapter here that critiques some of the, the student politics, so I'm also not uncritical about the way in which these fights are, are being fought. And I think you will find that uh, certain decisions that some people make about how they do or do not want to be helpful in, in helping to dismantle racism in our society are being critiqued by some people on the left. It's not the right way of doing business, and I think that's unhealthy. The common enemy is white supremacy. We'll take two, three, and four at the back. Yep, yeah, that's you in the, in the yellow. Okay. Seven. 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 Evie, uh, it's always a pleasure to hear you speak about race. Um, I have quite a 
quite frightening memories of you sitting in my um, road selection uh, <coughs> committee and us having quite a long conversation about race and racism within South Africa. Um, but I'm quite curious about um, a couple of topics that you've raised. Some of this will include comments and sure. as well as questions. But I think I'll begin with a question about the ways in which in the post apartheid era, um, you might be able to sort of think through race um, and privilege as a black person, and especially being in the UK. I've been speaking to some of my friends about the ways in which it's been quite um, a, uh, a shocking revelation that I am in fact more privileged than some white men within this country by virtue of being in Oxford. And that's a position I've never, ever espoused. I've, I've always been... Um, very aware of my own victimhood and continue to be at the bottom rung of many hierarchies. And so I don't think that there's any sort of um, absolute form of, of privilege that I've acquired, but there is a, a sense in which I, I do have more privilege in this particular space than even when I do return to South Africa. Mm. And in most of the places I travel to, um, sometimes do some interviews and research in refugee camps, and it, lots of different spaces and have to grapple with my own privilege there. So I'm quite curious about uh, ways in which movements that are are seeking to dismantle supremacy, uh, white supremacy in particular, but other forms of unearned privilege, are there um, principle we, principles we can extrapolate from that? What we would expect from white people, but what other you know less privileged people could expect from me as I you know move within different spaces. So that's the first question. Also, I'm quite curious about um, the ways in which um, anger can be man manifested and, and, and the strategic ways in which people can choose to engage with anger or not engage with it. Mm. And whether or not you think those are conversations that black people should be having within black spaces rather than in open spaces. And what, what does that look like? And, and how should those debates um, sort of take place? And, um, I, and my last comment slash question is one about white tears, which is a topic that you um, mentioned in your in your title. Um, I'm quite curious about the ways in which white fragility manifests within um, the liberal uh, our, our liberal friends and, and, and the ways in which um, those can be um, challenged. Was this revenge for the Rhodes interview? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, UB. I think the only thing you need to apologise to me for is mentioning the Bayer Beach Club in front of my students. <laughs> <laughs> um, and possibly for a talk uh, which references Fallon in the title, once again being nowhere near violent enough. Um, but anyway, my question is about anger. So I absolutely agree with you on the really important epistemic function that anger has, uh, particularly in puncturing discourses which insist on the invisibility or the non-existence of forms of discrimination, the insistence of rage in certain circumstances, the legitimacy of expressing it in all of these ways. Some people might think that that is very hard to reconcile with a commitment to interpersonal safe spaces, that having those two things at the same time is extremely difficult. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how that square is circled. Yes, um, Ms. Ibias, thank you very much uh, for that talk. Um, what I want to uh, ask you about is um, sort of your response to um, the sort of uh, um, uh, politics of certain students within the student movement who have said, um, as, as you've said, that um, there is a certain representation of what being a, bra a black radical looks like and sort of their the owners of that. Um, I do think there is a danger to misrepresent what students are actually saying. I think some are saying that the more sort of moderate or less angry black students or those black students that have a proximity to whiteness uh, and that can speak in particular ways um, and, and that can, in a sense, be more rational, be the more rational blacks, so to say, um, they are often used by those who manage the system in ways that actually defeat the whole struggle because then the system says, but we are talking to these blacks. Therefore, why are you the angry black? Like, there are these blacks who are not angry and we are kind of talking to them. Um, and so how do you see, you know, because my concern is that we can fall into the trap of asking people to speak outside of their bodies 
and as you were as you were saying, like sometimes it's just impossible for me to speak in a way that white supremacy de demands because it has a certain rational ideal of what it wants from me. Sometimes I just need to be the angry black, and it can be a very unintended consequence that when the system then decides that it will engage a particular moderate black, that we fall into the same silencing of more radical blacks because they are blacks that we are engaging and who are more rational. Mm. Okay. Uh, my question is, why should political philosophy be taught in and why isn't theorising just enough? I've got to ask a question to you. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay, we'll take one more round after this, and then but after that we can have drinks and talk and go to a pub if there's anyone left after the drinks. Um, I'll start with the last question. I don't think you have to. I mean, you know, it's... it's I'm a failed academic who still appreciates certain things about the academy, like academic freedom. If you want to spend your life as a political philosopher theorizing utopian societies, for example, I think that's perfectly acceptable. Okay, if you want to be, you know, specializing, um, like Professor, I think, uh, Williamson it is, on, I don't know, the metaphysics of color and spend 50 years doing that, I think that's perfectly acceptable. I think there's something intrinsically, maybe I'm a bit of a romantic about university still, there's something intrinsically um, I think praiseworthy in living a certain kind of academic and intellectual life. I don't think you, every single academic needs to suddenly find a public voice or be seen to be um, helping this, you know, in protests that are in decolonizing. So this is a deeply personal response. I could never go back to the academy full-time as a teacher and only live inside a university. I can't do that personally. I wouldn't impose that normatively on other academics around me but I find it very weird that I can imagine spending 50 years as a philosopher working on is the ideal concept of love one that is conditional or unconditional while around me, <laughs> while around me decolonization movements are happening. If I had to be a full-time philosophy lecturer in South Africa, I would be writing about, researching and teaching for starters, questions around identity, around race, around injustices, because those would be questions that for me interface with the world um, as we actually experience it. But it's deeply personal, and I wouldn't denigrate someone else who doesn't make their choice in terms of um, their career as an academic. Uh, I, I don't. I think <coughs> I don't share certain very reductionist views about the point of the academy just because I'm very passionate about, about uh, decolonization. Um, cool, we get to disagree in Tokozo. <laughs> so, as you <laughs> well, you know, I mean, this, this is a continuation of a fantastic earlier question because. As I think it's very important that we attribute some complexity to the way in which the identity politics and these strategic conversations are happening between black people and allies of black people, right? Because we don't have to agree on everything. So I want to keep it very plain and very simple and very blunt. The first thing for me that I find perverse is the idea that people who share certain ends can't disagree on questions about means or even some very particular question on the details about those ends. I find that absolutely nonsensical. I also find it incidentally anti-black because what it imagines is that black people are not capable of deep disagreement between them while still having shared goals practically and in terms of social justice. So there are, I mean, there are people who, it will be parochial for many people in the room who can gossip about it over beer. There are young black people in South Africa who really think that if someone else doesn't agree that capitalism is a bad thing, a bad system, then they aren't really committed to intersectionality. I mean, it's become so ridiculous that your commitment to intersectional politics now depends on whether you agree that capitalism must be overthrown tomorrow and Marxism must be revived as apparently no longer infeasible. <coughs> and I think, I think we've got to guard against that. We've got to allow for deep disagreement between us without <coughs> thinking that someone is less committed. And so I find some of your language problematic, to be honest. I mean, the first is the idea that if I speak white, if I've gone to a private school, if I've learned how to do the debate calmly, and I can mimic the processes that happen at Oxford University in a seminar, that, that makes me moderate. Thank you. Firstly, why do you, why do you, attach, <laughs> I mean, why do you attach the word moderate um, uncritically to me, the person who is calmly in conversation with whiteness? Why are you radical if you shout? Why can't I be radical in my, in my moderation? 
right? So I actually reject that because implicit in the way in which you are talking about the kinds of black people and the way in which we respond to whiteness is to imagine that someone who's calm and has white friends and doesn't want to come to Rose must fall is inherently not a radical. Well, why? Are you more of a radical because you're more angry? But I can also match your anger and still have my white friendships and still speak whiteness back to white people in the forms in which they are familiar with. So I find that offensive, to be honest, because there's a moral hierarchy between your use of the word moderate and radical. And the idea is that the person who is less emotive or doesn't sign up for certain very specific practices can't possibly be a radical. I think we've misunderstood each other. <laughs> um, but no, but you portray that in another part of the wording that you use, Mr. Kosa, when you talk about how white people or whiteness or institutions can then co-opt, basically, those exceptional blacks. So, oh, you see this, he's very well-spoken, he's a nice guy, he doesn't get angry. Why can't you be like him, Sizwe? Why can't you be like him, Mr. Kosa? But when you say you see this has been co-opted, you are actually undermining my bloody integrity and my intelligence. What makes you think that I am not aware of how this is playing out. Why can't you and I both be aware that some system or some individual person is trying to use me as a decoy for not engaging your very legitimate ra radical politics, right? So I think it's also very important that we don't undermine what my role in this hypothetical example would be as the person who engages differently with whiteness. And to imagine that I'm capable of being co-opted is to think that I'm blind to the ways in which someone is in conversation with me and the ways in which they may violently use me as a red herring to tell you how you should behave if you don't behave like me as the moderate black. So, yeah, I'm sure, I mean, you know, we can, we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, well, um, <laughs> so, I don't know how to answer this question sort of theoretically, but let me bring it down to earth, which is probably the most important. Angry black people are not as scary as they seem. Right? Uh, you know that. <laughs> Obviously. You know Africa better than me as a black person. But there is the idea of safe spaces. I find to be quite perverse when some people demand safe spaces. So I accept our agreements you know, about the value of anger, etc. But specifically on this question, this practical question around can the exhibition of anger sometimes reduce safe spaces? And I've got two problems with that, at least. The first is that black people who say that they are angry, a black woman who says that she's angry, are not unsafe, not a threat to me. So I find the performance of being unsafe, or the assertion that I feel unsafe in a particular space, to be bizarre. And I think very often, and I know this is a, this is a big claim, it won't apply everywhere, but I think sometimes when someone says, I feel unsafe in this space, it's really just because a black body inherently, you know, is experienced as a threatening object. I think that's what it is. Um, and so I find that one needs to be, in my opinion, a little bit cautious of people who declare that they are unsafe, because often what it really just portrays is a lack of familiarity of how to interact with a black body. And a black body is something that is just unsafe, which we experienced when we were bound from gay clubs in London the other day. Um, <laughs> And my Oxonian accent didn't help when I tried to manufacture one. <laughs> and that's because people probably see a black bouncer in front of them and that it conjures up all sorts of things. Big booming voice, this guy's probably from Brixton, he might come in and knife someone. Those are the kinds of memes associated with a big physical black body. So when people say unsafe, that's actually what they mean. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, you see this is someone who nerdishly is happy to have 10 pints and just have a nerdish conversation until 2 o'clock in the morning. So, just empirically, I question this claim that certain spaces are becoming unsafe. I think it's actually just revealing a pathological fear of black bodies. But, you know, in, in addition to, to that, um, I also think that it's interesting how safety is associated again with calm and not getting angry. I can tell you now that for minority types, calm spaces are unsafe. We never call them unsafe. When you are a poor black South African and you go to a South African university, your daily experience is that of someone who's in an unsafe space. It is not home, it's not familiar, there is 
food insecurity, there's the fear of putting up your hand and asking a question when precocious kids, kids fluent in English who went to schools you couldn't afford to can prioritize the conversation to be about them because they have those pedagogical backgrounds that, that have enabled them to be confident, to ask questions. And so unsafe spaces are an interesting thing that have just come up this year in pushback against uh, the protests. And suddenly an unsafe space is a space in which there's physicality performed by a black body. But actually, the history of anti-black racism is the history of a world in which black people silently are negotiating unsafe spaces daily. It doesn't announce itself as white physical presence because it's far more ubiquitous than that. So not only do I find it nonsense to imagine that a person who emotes is a threat to me, but conversely, I think that many white people have never thought about how institutional whiteness actually makes certain spaces, including Oxford, a, a space where black people walk around, no emotions are being exhibited around you, but these spaces are unsafe spaces for black people. So the correlation between physicality and anger and emotion and safety is one that I would question. Um, I don't know if, okay, there's too many points there to engage. We want to take one last, <coughs> one last one, so I will just engage one of your, one of your points. I think, I mean, white tears are an interesting thing. Um, there's a meme going around at the moment that I haven't seen, that I've been told of, to the effect of, it's not that white men don't show emotions, just, they call their emotion rationality. <laughs> right? And I, and I think there's some, some powerful truth to that. Um, I think, and I'm going to put on my hat here as Dr. Phil, that a lot of the reason why white tears are being spilled all over the place in an attempt to push back against some of the decolonization movement and the student protest is just because of a perceived loss of power. I mean, the caricatures that you've seen in South Africa of the student movements, I think, ultimately stem from not small IQs on the part of the critics. Some of the critics are people that I deeply respect and regard as my favorite columnist, like Gareth Amonsley. One of the sharpest people in the country. I love reading his column. So the question then becomes, how do I, I mean, obviously this is deeply subjective, I could just be wrong, but how do I reconcile a deep love of this guy's IQ and, and brain and his writing style with the fact that I, I, I think that he's dead wrong on some issues and in a way that he sometimes, you know, results in incredibly ad hominem attacks of students and people that he interacts with. And, and for me, the reconciliation is easy. I think it's just what happens when equality is demanded of you and, um, and you've always been experiencing privilege. I think there's a, a perceived loss of power that they struggle to deal with and it comes out in these vitriolic ways that they are used to exhibiting and a sense of entitlement and privilege. You also saw it in relation, for those of you interested in South African politics, over leadership changes in the Democratic Alliance. There's this incredible fear amongst white liberals who used to be members of the party or still are, but write letters to newspapers bemoaning a change in the heart of the party. And, and the reason why they mischaracterize some of the changes that are necessary and good changes in the Democratic Alliance is because there's a fear that you will lose power and all these black people are going to swamp your, your party that you own. And so for me, um, white tears are, are much of a muchness. They're just an exhibition of, of people who are scared of losing power. Okay, so we'll take a final round. Sure, we'll, we'll take Quick a final one. round and then ask Eusebius just to respond very quickly and he can take it up with you over, over drinks um, after that. So it looks like there's... We'll take the, those three. The, yes, we'll take you and then... Yeah, 
in summary, how do we get people to be angry? Um, Agitate for anger in Oxford. Well, the problem is structural. Sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's not that easy. I mean, we can go and shout outside of um, you know, Oriel College and they get those laugh at us. Um, Fair but, enough. But how do we actually get people to be sufficiently angry? Because like, you know, there's a reason why the Rhodes statue didn't fall in 94 in South Africa. People weren't sufficiently angry. Mm -hmm. And and how do we how do we go about this in, in, a, in a situation like Oxford where structures are centuries old and they build to resist change? Mm -hmm. I would like to ask uh, what you thought about the future of the student movement in South Africa, how you think um, it's, it can connect to other widespread protests in South Africa, whether it, it, yeah, just about the future and, the, and generally the, the problems. But... Um, there's a lot to say. <laughs> so I'll try to just pick one of the things. Um, yeah. Hopefully we can continue after it. I mean, the first thing I wanted to say was I think it's important that we actually talk about what is identity politics, because this is a term that's thrown about a lot, uh, and it sort of has this connotation of something that the non sort of hegemonic demographic, that is, people who aren't, you know, the white male, straight, privileged person, uh, as ascribe to, but I think that, that it's misleading because the whole society is actually built on an identity politics, right? That is the identity of that the person I just described, yes. right? So um, when people get challenged on this, it's, it's sort of like the affirmative action thing, or what, you know, black economic empowerment, positive discrimination, interesting how the term actually is different in each country, mm. US, UK, and, and South Africa. Um, but one of the arguments that, that I constantly find myself making is like affirmative action, I'm from the US, so, you know, affirmative action in that context um, people, white people who oppose it don't realize that the society is built on affirmative action for white people, right? It's built on affirmative action for men in the sense that male supremacy and, and white supremacy and, and these kind of systems affirmatively act in favor of those who benefit from them. And so I think in a similar, similar way we have to say identity politics actually is subscribed to by the dominant, uh, you know, the rich white male and so on. It's just their identity as opposed to another one. The identification with, with Eurocentrism, with, with whiteness, with um, these kinds of things. The second, the second com comment I wanted to make was about um, the, the right to speech versus, um, you were saying, you were distinguishing between a speech act versus uh, the right to speak. And I think there's another way to, to think about that as well, which is that um, they confuse the, the, fr the free speech or the right to speak with the hegemony of their speech. So, for example, you know, France talks a lot about free speech and all these things, um, which I think totally misses the ways in which France is and has been a deeply colonially implicated and imperialist power, which is denying the right to speak to the thousands of, you know, dead black bodies at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, for example. Mm -hmm. What right to free speech ha have they? What right to free speech ha ha has the country of Libya, which they destroyed in 2011, or Iraq, or Afghanistan, or any number of those places? So I think. You know, hegemony, the, the, the supremacy of whiteness um, is too often conflated with the right to speak. And when we challenge it, it's like, oh, you're saying I can't speak. It's like, no, we're saying that you cannot be the hegemon any longer. You need to come down off your pedestal. You need to have some respect and humility for non-Western, non-male, non-white voices um, and kind of, you know, take a seat and listen for a second. So uh, just as another way, perhaps, of, of understanding, you know, um, that argument. One minute. Okay, uh, one minute. I totally agree with you. Um, I, I think that anyone who lives in this world as a social creature necessarily have identity markers, whether they choose to or not. And I think part of the normativity of whiteness is precisely that you do not have to be consciously aware of your identity markers because they're not a site of assault. And when they are not, you can pretend that somehow you are an individual without any social identity, which of course is bullshit. Um, I also agree with you that part of the pushback is against the hegemony of free speech. Um, I think that's a very different distinction to the one that I was making. It does lend itself to interesting tactical disagreements between allies. So, for example, and another unfinished debate into cause and I will have later, is whether the hegemony of free speech that some people enjoy means that we shouldn't invite invitations to them to speak. I, for example, enjoy it when a racist arrives. I prefer them to people who agree with me. It gives me an opportunity to show the moral impotence 
and also the stupidity of the content of racism, right? So I agree with you on the hegemony. Sometimes I like hegemony speaking. It gives me a chance to shine as a minority. Um, on the other, very, very, very briefly, I don't know. I mean, you're asking a very important question. I, I don't know the question. I'm a very bad activist. I'm just beginning to feel for the first time as a writer. Until now, I've merely been a writer. So frankly, you as students who are involved in these decolonization movements are better able to puzzle through that question. How do we get, how do we get Oxford students, more Oxford students, to learn to be angry and to feel? I, I don't know the answer. I think it's a profoundly important question. And then the final question about the future of student movement in South Africa, I think it's actually fascinating, the challenges that the student movement are currently facing. Um, so literally, at the risk of being very melodramatic, I think the very first challenge that the student movement in South Africa face, faces is the Christmas break. There is incredible momentum that was achieved uh, right up to the point to the march uh, to the union buildings in, in Pretoria. And it was incredibly important getting that small, a little victory, even though it's, it's not quite what the movement is about. And so they can't, you know, be resting easily just because there's no fee increase next year, which hasn't even been costed. And some people who are privileged will accidentally benefit, which is undesirable, etc., etc. So the very first challenge for the student movement is, will there still be a vibrant student movement come February when you have to go back to university? I hope so. And I think the answer is yes. A second challenge, and there are many more, but I'll just end on this one, is that the students are for the first time now learning what it's like to face the challenge of a divide and rule tactics on the part of the state and the ANC as well. So one of the wonderful things about the student movement so far is that although the student leaders or leaders in inverted commas because they're all leaders um, have come from different political homes that they've been united in fighting against a state and a society that is exclusionary. Now we've seen, however, an attempt by the ANC in particular to try and deal with the menace of the student protesters um, by appealing to their political cleavages that they have. And one of the strategic questions that the students now have to answer, which of course the ANC leaders in the state are very familiar with because they faced the same 30, 40 years ago, is what do we do when we have money being offered? What do we do if we can have a secret meeting with someone who's really cool and important? And the moral integrity of the student movement is being tested. So, first, um, two rounds of applause. The first, <laughs> first, not yet. <laughs> the first for Dr. Nathaniel Adam Tobias Coleman, who not only set up this venue, but is also responsible for the free drinks which come out of his entertainment budget. So give it up for him. <laughs> leading figure behind the swell of, of opinion and change of opinion and these kind of events at, at this scale in Oxford. So much respect to him and to all the people in Rhodes Must Fall who contributed to tonight's event. And then finally, to our fantastic speaker who's sparked debate, provoked thought, and I suppose generated some disagreement, which is always important. And I think a fantastic and brilliant speech. Please join me in a rousing applause for the speaker.